Welcome everyone. Afro Historian here, bringing you more West African history and myths. Continuing off from the previous episode, we are still going to be in the Ivory Coast, but a lot of the history was very scant, so unfortunately, I was not able to find a kingdom or society that was able to be a full-length episode on its own, similar to how I did the Dahomey series. However, there are many small kingdoms and societies, plus moments in history, that are well worth talking about. So, we're going to talk about two, one moment in history, and one kingdom in the Ivory Coast. But I do hope you'll find it enjoyable. This can be listened to while you're going about your daily business at home or on the go. For our moment in history, we are going to be talking about the Asikaso Rebellion. For those unfamiliar with the name or the location, Asikaso, at this time, was a small village, sandwiched between several great empires in the region that would become the Ivory Coast, or Côte d'Ivoire. And you might think, being between all these huge empires, that it would have been taken over by one of them. But it was lucky, because it had one particular resource that allowed it to eke out its survival, its supply of rubber trees. As this was set during the 1800s, rubber production and rubber manufacturing was at an all-time high as many of the European powers needed a lot of this rubber, and the people of Asikaso were skilled at manufacturing rubber and due to its location being sandwiched between all the major empires, it was able to trade with all of them, and by acting as a neutral party to this trade, that was what allowed it to have its security. It also gave the Asikaso a very strong sense of independence, and would not be pleased when the French would eventually come along to challenge that notion. The village itself, had a population of over 1,000 people by the late 1800s, and they were no stranger to trading rubber with the Europeans. As the Asikaso were introduced to contemporary technologies of rubber production, they were slowly struggling to meet the demands of both Europe and the Americas who were demanding much more rubber. Then came the scramble for Africa, and France felt that it was entitled to control over Côte d'Ivoire. The French started making vassalization treaties with several nearby Anie and Abron kingdoms. The main reason why the French thought that they had automatic control of Asikaso was because they had made the error of initially assuming that Asikaso was a province of the kingdom of Giaman. It had seemingly assumed this due to the extensive trade that went on between Giaman and Asikaso. And due to this mistake, the French thought that the vassalization treaty meant that they owned Asikaso and its rubber production which the French wanted to have a monopoly on. Initially, the French forays seemed benign. The French started to build much higher quality roads that led directly to French ports than the ones the British had built decades prior and promised safety on the roads in order to encourage the people of Asikaso to naturally favor the French more as a trading partner. What turned off the Asikaso was that the French were not willing to pay any of the agreed-upon prices that the British and other kingdoms were willing to pay. The French were more interested in bartering for the rubber goods, which meant that the Asikaso were losing a steady rate of income for its goods and services. 
the French initially realized this mistake and tried to buy out Asikaso, but the village was not very receptive to French advances. So, this did not help matters with the European perceptions versus the local perceptions of Gold Coast affairs. To the residents of the land in the nicknamed Gold Coast, there were no British or French Africans, just kingdoms that chose a large business partner for their needs. As such, they would continue to trade between them regardless of relations between the European powers. The European powers, however, would see this as a form of treasonous fraternization. The French did not see Asikaso trading with fellow Akan people. They saw a vassal that they saw as theirs trading with the British. The French did not want to go the military route and slow down production of rubber as they needed it, so they decided to set up posts around Asikaso in the territories that had agreed to serve the French, slowly making it so that the French would be the only viable trading partner, especially since the Asikaso recognized that the French were now the true rulers of what to them were once mighty empires. The French decided in 1897 to literally put up a post on the Asikaso's figurative doorstep, even putting a small military presence in order to try and get the point across to the Asikaso. The French tried to assuage fears by stating that they were simply expanding the road network and that the military presence was for the safety of travelers and traders. The French also gave the nobles of Asikaso some bribes in order to pacify them and see the French as guests, but that would not last as the French now with a definite foothold on the village, began to try and make forays into Asikaso. The French then gave boons to those nobles who traded with the correct Europeans, increasing their personal wealth and hampering the economic ability of long-established merchant families. These nouveau riche Asikaso would be provided with French auxiliary forces that confiscated the goods of their rivals and employed brutal tactics against treacherous traders. When the Asikaso made complaints to the French Empire about these brutal tactics, the French did nothing and told the Asikaso that if they did not want to suffer, then they should do as the more French aligned merchants had been doing. By 1898, the French were imposing fines on attempts to trade with British controlled kingdoms, hampering the Asikaso economically and increasing their ire. The French were trying to funnel all the trade directly to their ports, and sometimes the French would sell the refined rubber back to the Asikaso at higher prices. So the Asikaso likely felt that was a bit of an insult. Understandable and justifiable. All these indignities became hard to swallow and in late 1898 there was a standoff between the French militia stationed at the trading post and the Asikaso military. No shots were fired at this point, but it signaled to the French that the Asikaso were going to be slightly harder to subjugate than was initially anticipated. The little trading post of the French started to become a garrison with more troops 
being assigned to fill it, should the Asikaso decide to get serious. The French felt that the Asikaso did not fully yet appreciate the dominance of the French Empire. The increased tensions didn't happen in just Asikaso. A lot of its neighbors were also suffering economically under the French stranglehold. And when the French decided to do one of their inspections on treasonous goods, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. The French had assaulted a beloved trading partner of the Asikaso and had stolen his property. The people of Asikaso gathered in huge numbers and arrived outside the garrison, demanding that the trader be let go and his goods returned to him. The acting commandant of the garrison ordered the Asikaso outside to disperse or be fired upon. The people refused and continued to state their demands, so the commandant gave the order to fire into a group of civilians. Several villagers died instantly, but instead of sending the villagers fleeing in fear, as the commandant had hoped, it made them angry and they charged the garrison. While many of the villagers died in their initial rampage towards the garrison, they were able to force the garrison members to seal themselves in. News of this reached the Asikaso's neighbors and over 300 soldiers from all around Asikaso joined in this siege. It was not easy as the French had long anticipated unrest and had fortified the garrison extremely well so that the bullets were bouncing off the walls and once the locals got close enough a bayonet charge would make them retreat. Thus the tactic changed to encirclement and sieging the garrison. The Asikaso determined that they could not break the wall, but also that they could simply try and starve the soldiers out. The siege lasted 63 days, and the troops at the garrison were about to surrender. The Asikaso had made assaults at night, and had poked and prodded at the garrison, depriving them of much needed sleep and relaxation and some of these forays were somewhat successful in slowly bleeding the troop numbers from the garrison. What saved the soldiers of the garrison was the arrival of reinforcements in the form of the infamous Senegalese Trailleurs, the elite African fighting force under the control of the French. These troops broke the encirclement and pushed the locals back away from the garrison. After relieving the beleaguered garrison, the Tyrolliers proceeded to destroy As Icaso and its allies utterly, killing the ringleaders, burning villages, and forcing rubber production to cease and famine to occur. From then on, As Icaso will be watched over by the military until 1903 with the Asikaso having submitted to French power after witnessing how brutally the French could dominate an enemy. Thus rubber production was now 100% owned by the French in the region. Now for a look at an actual kingdom this time. This is going to be a quick look at the Kong or Ouattara or Ouattara Empire. We're going to go back in time to the 1700s to look at a much larger political body. The Kong Empire, as I said before, also known as Watara or Uatara, but in most historical documents I have found, they are listed as either the Watara or the Kong. But I'm going to mostly call them the Watara to avoid any mental confusion with King Kong from Hollywood or Donkey Kong from Nintendo. 
so we'll stick with Watara for the most part. According to a mix of local histories and scholarly investigations, the story of the Kong is related to the decline of the Mali Empire. By the 16th century, many Diula, an ethnic subgroup of the dominant ethnic Mande population of the Mali Empire, left the heart of the empire to find their own piece of land. The problem, as with most migrations to discover new land at this point in time, is that people were already living there. The two main groups already established in the land that would become Kong were the Senufo and the Tayefo peoples. These two groups were subgroups of a larger ethnic group known as the Gur that lived in many parts of what would be known as Ivory Coast. And the Diula did not get along with the natives for mostly religious reasons. While the Diula were an Islamic society, the native Gur-speaking tribes of the Senufo and Taifo still followed an animist tradition. While the Diula built a city for themselves named Bego, the city was later destroyed, most likely due to conflicts of religion as speculated. The Diula then moved to a land that became Kong, and due to previous interactions with other tribes, the Diula, or the Watara as they would later call themselves, founded several merchant warhouses that would make raids to other tribes in order to get resources. These warhouses would often make a lot of raids specifically for the point of getting prestige, slaves, and gold. The slaves they would sell to make gold, and with the prestige, these warhouses could be hired by a lot of the bigger empires around them to act as mercenary forces for them, in order to gain better boons or regiments. With the security provided by these various warhouses in Kong, many merchants, clerics and nobles began to settle there, increasing its power and pushing against the Senufo and Taifo. But, by the very early 1700s, two kingdoms from the north of Ghana had their eyes on Kong. These were the Goncha Kingdom and the Dagomba Kingdom. These two kingdoms would try to make many forays into Kong as they wanted the vast resources that Kong had access to. But, due to all the various war houses there, they were each able to fend off the two kingdoms, and that's how a lot of these war houses gained power. Of these war houses, the story of the Kong Empire actually starts further away from Kong in a town nine miles away called Tenagala. The town was larger and more powerful than Kong, and was also ruled by a merchant council. One of these wealthy merchants was a man named Seku Watara. Seku was wealthy enough to amass his own armies and engage in a joint expedition alongside the Ganja kingdom to attack their enemies. In thanks, the Ganja gave Seku access to improve firearms technology. This would help with the problem that reared its head around this time. The most powerful merchant of Kong, Lasiri Bambele, Lasiri was Seku's uncle by marriage, and a man of high influence in both Kong and Tenegala. It was known that Lasiri and Seku did not get along, but the details of their animosity have been mythologized or rewritten as spoilers. Seku would win the conflicts. The story painted Lasiri as an Islam-hating animist that lusted after Seku's mother. Lasiri was said to exile Muslim clerics and try to build a cult around himself called the Nya cult. The cleric then hired mercenaries 
the cleric that was exiled, mind you, from the Fulani kingdom of Messina. The mercenaries were stationed on Patoni Hill, 70 kilometers south of Kong. These mercs would take young men and train them in both the way of the blade and the gun to create forces that could work for the various war houses. One of the main financial founders for this burgeoning army was Seku himself, who became fast friends with the cleric. Seku was also able to make large amounts of profit with this fighting force and had several of these soldiers inserted into armies that were supposed to be loyal to Lassiri. While Seku was making allies, Lassiri was angering the nearby kingdoms and tribes with his cult and religious exclusion in Kong. Joining Seku against Lassiri was the traditional animist high priest of Kong. Several Muslim clerics that also had military power and the rulers of the Ben, the Nabe, and the Mioro, who Lassiri had all angered. Seku was even able to make a large purchase of cavalry in exchange for providing services with his mercenaries to the kingdom of Komono. Seku's main accomplishment before open conflict with his uncle was becoming fast friends with Lassiri's top general. This created a situation that allowed for a rapid victory for Seku when he finally took up arms against Lassiri. Most of Lassiri's army switched sides in the middle of battle and when Lassiri was routed, Seku was able to capture him and execute him. One would think that this conflict would be the end of that, but Seku was then able to take over all of Kong and expand the territories further. He wanted the best trade routes that would bring in more wealth to the newly formed Watara Kingdom, based on his last name, Watara, so Seku Watara. To the south, Seku desired the Ano region, which was rich in kola knots and had access to European goods and more importantly, European firearms. To the north were trade routes in the Sahel region that brought high quality goods from the Messina Empire to the west and all the kingdoms that existed along the Niger River. Seku really had his heart set on access to the Sahel and thus the centers of Islamic learning along the banks of said Niger River. The main problem for Seku was the Asante Empire. The Asante, as we've seen in previous episodes and will likely see in future ones, served as a great roadblock to many a burgeoning state with great ambitions. Seku also wanted control of Yaman, similar to the Asante, but he needed to not be seen as a bloodthirsty conqueror, so he assigned his brother Famanga to handle most of the military campaigns to the south. By the 1730s, once Kong had been secured, by placating the other war houses and getting them to side with him, Seku sent Famanga to the Mohun region to expand the scope of the Fletcher Empire. Accompanying Famanga were two of Seku's sons and several other leaders of the various war houses. The war houses ostensibly worked under Seku but were allowed complete autonomy and Seku supported them as long as a percentage of proceeds went to him. This money allowed him to strengthen his main defensive force and he always made sure that a lot of the soldiers that he gifted these war houses were secretly loyal to him in the event that a war house thought that Seku was becoming weak. Famanga and his nephews were repelled at the Battle of Dande when they assumed that they were going to have an easy victory against farmers but were not expecting a substantial military resistance. Eventually, the expeditions to the south became successful and they were able to secure rock salt mines 
as well as the access to the European ports and to a good supply of horses. With these resources secured, Seku and his family turned their attention towards the emergent Asante, and the two powers fought over Giaman. The Asante won the battles for control over Giaman, and Seku had to accept that the Asante was an opponent that was too strong to beat. In order to stabilize the region and create a proper legacy, Seku made each of his twelve sons chiefs of the various provinces that he had established, and he raised them in a position over all the other merchant war houses so that this dynasty would still secure power for the entire family long after he died, or so he hoped. Once he did die in 1735, the family was still able to maintain power thanks to the reforms he had implemented in Kong, and his brother Famanga was placed as the new ruler without much incident, well, except for one major humbug in this situation. The humbug in question was Seku's eldest son, Kere Mori, who felt that he should rule instead of his uncle. After all, he was an adult, and he had fought alongside Fomanga in the military campaigns, and he was no stranger to leadership, having been elected a chief in a provincial area. Fomanga decided that he wanted to reduce any over-tension between any of his nephews, but he did deny Karimori's claims to the throne, but he did move out of the capital of the empire in a province in what is now Mali. Fumanga claimed several northern provinces for himself, and made sure to let his nephews play out their little power games, but made sure to be allies on the surface with all of them. It was important that the family look like they were united, even though they had problems with each other. This was because they were aware that the other war houses would figuratively pounce on them if they sniffed a single drop of metaphorical blood. The alliance within the family held, and when the family mounted a military expedition to the ancient city of Jene, they were repelled by a man named Biton Kulibali the famous founder of what would become Mali's Bambara Empire. Famanga was not as charismatic as his late brother Seku, and could not consolidate power in the same way, which eventually led to the Kong Empire becoming a decentralized state. The lineage of the Watara still held significance, as many would claim this lineage, but the merchant classes now held a lot of power similar to the pre seku days, only they were now invested in the maintenance of the empire. There were attempts by the ruling classes to encourage mixing within the tribes in order to create an identity of being a member of the Watara Empire rather than being part of an ethnic group with ties to other nations. The empire itself managed to last for more than a century, building libraries as a dedication to Islam. But with all the many empires surrounding Watara and the European empires increasing in presence, they were no longer a major point of significance in the region. On February 20th, 1888, the empire found themselves visited by French officer Louis Gustave Binger, who offered to allow them to maintain their autonomy as long as they submitted to French control. The empire was willing to go with this arrangement as it would increase profits that they received from the French. This would actually be a death knell for the empire, but not at the hands of the French, but by another African empire called the Wasalu. The Wasalu were another Islamic empire that did not want to cede to French control, 
and thus used Kong as a front for their war against the French, and turned the Watara into a battlefield during what is known as the Mandingo Wars. But Kong was utterly destroyed by 1898. The royal house of Watara was able to flee and form their own smaller kingdoms that the French called Les Etats de Kong or Les Etats de Watara, which means the states of Watara. But they would have never had the size that the Watara Empire once held. The French did eventually push back the Wasalu and tried to rebuild the city of Kong, and it got resettled with around 3,000 people, but it would never have the prominence it once had. We are going to stop here for now, as I have bigger targets for next episode. We're looking at myths from Mali for the first one, but after that, we're going to be looking at the Songhai Empire, and yes, we will be looking at its entire history, and not just Sony Ali Bear. I'm Afrostorian, wishing you all a good day, signing out.